Well, hello, good morning. Once again, welcome to Whispering Hope, Daily Lesson Study. And I have with me this morning Elder Maskell and Elder Vaughn Joseph. This is the last episode in quarter two, and we have come to the end. It was a blessing to have Elder Maskell and Elder Vaughn, you know, take the lesson apart weekly, and we really appreciate them. I'm going to ask them this just before going to the lesson to greet you and say good morning, and then to share with me what's their take on the lesson for this quarter. We talk about what they take away from today's lesson at the end, but I'll ask them now when they greet you to tell me what's their take on the lesson for this quarter. Elder Maskell, good morning. How are you doing? Good morning, Ella Joseph, and I'm indeed okay, in Jesus' name, encouraged. And I guess you wanted my takeaway from the quarter? Yes, what? Well, for one, I enjoyed the drama because, you know, it helps me as a real lesson as it relates to life. But I think for me is the takeaway would have been the lesson that we looked at how Joseph would have been so open and so forgiving to his brother and the wisdom that he himself would have taken in order for him to determine whether or not he, they would have changed. And so looking at the whole story, Elder Joseph, at the end of the day, the family reunited, they were able to hug each other and they were able to be happy again, even though God had some providential requirements in that for happen where he separated Joseph from them and eventually they came back together but God is all powerful his hand is in that life back then their lives back then and I'm convinced that God himself will work out things in our lives as well so it was an overall encouragement for me as a personal Chris personally for me as a Christian to continue to grow and allow God to transform me in the way that he wants to transform me elder Joseph so it's a broad, it's broad because the lesson itself was a broad spectrum, Brother Joe. So it, to, to just take out one aspect, it was difficult. <laughs> well, all I can say is that the lesson really brought out a lot of personal points. And I saw that you were enjoying it as we went through it. And I learned about Sister Pascal as we went through it as well, as about myself. And I know that Elder Vaughn was enjoying it too sometimes the way he Got into it. I knew he was taken. So, Elder Vaughan, what is your big takeaway or takeaways of this quarter's lesson? Good morning, everyone. Happy to be here once again. Thanks for being on the panel uh, once again with Sister Maskell and you, Elder Joseph. This whole quarter, studying Genesis, it brought out to me the relentless pursuit of God after his wayward people. You saw the ugly, the gore the nasty, in so many of the patriarchs and prophets. You saw the downright scoundrel that some of them were. And yet still, it's amazing how God relentlessly pursued after them. And the power that he has and the power that he used to radically, totally transform lives in Genesis. And last but not least, that of Jacob and also the brothers of Joseph. And so for me, Elder, reading and studying Genesis once again, it always, you know, the Bible always brings out something that you never really saw before. And it always something to enhance your understanding of our God and our Creator. So for me, God pictures big in Genesis in that he is a faithful God and his providence always goes out that he will accomplish and fulfill the promises that he has given to all of us. And it's just marvelous. Well, the, the truth when you look at that, I, I like the way you describe it, the nasty, the, the, you know, the unbelievable things that happen. And sometimes we of ourselves feel nasty and, you know, and the detestable things that we would have done from the detestable things we would have done as Christian. And sometimes some people feel ashamed. Some people feel powerless to go forward. But certainly if they followed us all the way through, in this quarter's lesson, they would understand that, as you rightly said, God will never leave us nor forsake us. He is in constant pursuit of us in spite of our missteps. As we go into this week's lesson, Israel 
in Egypt, as we go into, we look at Israel in Egypt, we're going to see Jacob in Egypt. And so as we go into the lesson today, Jacob settles in Egypt. We're going to go into our usual session. We're going to have Elder Vaughan praying for us today, and Elder Maskell will read for us our memory text. All right, let us have a word of prayer. I invite those of us who are watching to just pause for a moment. Father God, we thank you, O Lord, for the privilege of being in the land of the living. Indeed, for being able to come to the, uh, the, the last week of this quarter's study of your book, Genesis. Lord, we're grateful that your presence is with us. And so as we study this morning, as we discuss and deliberate, Lord, may we rightly represent you, even in our preparation day, Lord. I pray, O God, that what we say and what we do will be a means of reflecting the true image of God and not of ourselves. Bless each one of us on the panel today. Bless those who are watching their Lord, we pray. And may their hearts be opened up to Christ and to life eternal. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, memory text this morning is brought to us, Genesis 47, 27. So Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the country of Goshen, and they had possessions where, there and grew and multiplied exceedingly. Elder Vaughan and Elder Mascal, really interested with the way you handled this quarter's lesson. I know some people like when we tell the story over and over again, but what I really like about the team this quarter is that you spent time personalizing the message, and that's what it should be. Not telling the story, we have been hearing that since children's division, prime week in trade role, they've been repeating these stories to us. But what does it mean to you as an individual? And I'm happy that you all brought out that those salient points that we should learn in this quarter's lesson. Now we start today, this week's lesson, Jacob settles in Egypt. And Elder Vaughan, you should have read Genesis chapter 47 for as you go through the lesson this morning. And what spiritual truths and principles can we find in this account? Spiritual truths and principles. All right. So Genesis 47 speaks about, you know, Joseph, uh, Joseph's family meeting that of Pharaoh and coming down to Egypt and so on and so forth. It speaks of the great influence that Joseph had and the wit or the wisdom that God gave to him as a quote-unquote prime minister or second in command of, of Egypt. And so Joseph was in a position where after all of the dreams that he had, which he told his mother, father, and brothers about, and this now has come full circle. It has come to fruition. And Joseph is now in a position where he can protect his, his brothers um, who have come down to Egypt. And so we see in the entire chapter 47, I'm not going to, you know, sum up the whole thing now, but in chapter 47, we definitely see the blessings that God had promised to Abraham from the very outset about him having being a blessing to all the nations of his seed you know, multiplying as a sand on the seashore. We see now Jacob blessing Pharaoh. Imagine that, Jacob blessing Pharaoh. We see the providence of God coming through in that the blessings of the nations, the blessing of the world is actually being practiced and propagated by Jacob by blessing the leader of the then most powerful nation, perhaps, and indeed all of his inhabitants. And so we see here that, yes, the word of God, the knowledge of God, the exposure, the shining of the light of God to others is taking place as God had promised to Abraham through his descendants, Jacob and Joseph. And we also see Joseph here being the guardian of his people in that protecting them from not saying or misrepresenting themselves to Pharaoh Hence, things could have gone differently if they might not have been honest and true and above what about their profession, about what they're there for, about their surgery. And, and so, you know, I'll, I'll just leave it there for now, Elder, but definitely I see the power of God and the providence of God, the spreading of God's word coming through live and fresh in chapter 47 of Genesis. Interesting to learn this week, you know, that 
we don't like to go through checkpoints and be interrogated by by immigration. But we see that this was way back in the Bible. They were interrogating Joseph Jacob's family, you know, to see what the occupation was. Interesting. Elder yeah. Pascal, how many of his brothers did Joseph present to Pharaoh and why? Okay, Elder Joseph, so we're going to take this from the Bible. It's in um, chapter 47 and verse 2. And it says, and he took some of his brethren, even five men, and presented them unto Pharaoh. And as you said, you know, this was immigration, <laughs> immigration process, because even before they went down to Egypt, I'm sure that Joseph would have said to Pharaoh, look, my family's coming. But at the end of the day, in all fairness, the only person that Pharaoh had in front of him was just Joseph. He had no background about Joseph. He didn't know about his relations, you know. So I can imagine when I'm a leader of a country, this man has been so good to me. He actually saved my people. He actually making me look good. And as you read it, read in chapter 47, he was increasing my riches. So you want to know where did this incredible, incredible brother come from? You know, let me meet his people. And it would be security, as you would have said, Brother Joseph, for him, it would be a responsible thing for him as a leader of a nation to know who are these people, all 70 of them, who are well, not really 70, but I think it's about 66 that it was numbered, and Joseph and his and his children would have made up the other. Who are they coming to be in my country? And so he called them in and he questioned them. But something jumped out at me, Elder Joseph, and I guess in the next, you have us answer this later on. It's the fact that he was, he wanted to know what is it these men are good at? You know, he questioned their profession. But I also think, the, the, you know, he was curious to see, are they in alignment with perhaps what I've seen in Joseph? So he was kind of creating and trying to fix that jigsaw that has been in his head. And they had the final piece to it, Brother Joseph, as to perhaps, who was this Joseph? Who was this Joseph? How can I relate? What I have assumed of him over the years, this is the final piece that convinces me because our background, our family traits, Elder Joseph, it speaks of us and it tells us a bigger story than us standing up before anybody. It's like watching you and in a court, you know, your character can speak for you, but the character is built from your background, your family and all that other things. So I just wanted, I don't know if this is me feeding into, but Elder, Elder Vaughn will let me know the assumptions as to why, because it was not necessarily clear except for the profession, but I believe Pharaoh wanted to know more. Yeah, I'm going to allow Elder Vaughn to speak on it because as a person who worked closely with political people, the fact is, if you are that good and you think you were on the right vein, <laughs> if you are that good, then something good must be in the other members of your family. And you are causing me to get blessing. And if I pull a few more close to me, that may bring more blessing to me. And so they're trying to, as it were, line him up to say, look, can I get more of these guys so I can get more blessings? Or can I reward them for what Joseph has been doing for me and put a few of them in some prominent positions around here? That's politically speaking, but I'm going to ask, Elder Ward to do some exegesis. <laughs> well, you know, Elder, Joseph is the savior of his family. Joseph is the one who God put in place to be the one that will precursor Christ, so to speak. I mean, it's known in several quarters, in several schools of thought, through theologians, that Joseph is a type of Christ. Meaning that what he did and how he saved his father and his brothers and all of his siblings or family members was a type of Christ being the savior. So here is it that you have your brothers down in Egypt before Pharaoh and uh, you know already that Egypt is, is a pagan country. You've experienced that, but you held on to your God and you know that your family worshiped the true God of heaven. You don't want them, especially your brothers, to be involved or to get intertwined or intertangled, as you mentioned, Elder, just a while ago about political realms and so on. You don't want them to be getting involved in that political realm of being giving a position in government and having 
rulership over people and having to answer to Pharaoh and so on and so forth. Not to get involved in that kind of a mess because Egypt is not their home. It is not a place where they're supposed to be settling down and living forever. They still had on their mind the promised land, which they need to go back to. And so just say, according to Joseph, just say that you guys are shepherds, just like you are, and that you're just sojourning. You're just here for a temporary time. Don't get tied to Pharaoh. Yes, I'm Joseph. I've been here set down into slavery, and I've risen to this position. But you guys... We don't need anybody else to be within the realm of the political swaying thing because it's not a nice thing, okay? And his brothers had challenges. Not that Joseph didn't have challenges, but they had challenges as well spiritually. And so he didn't want them to get involved in that. He protected them. He told them what to say, what answers to give to the great Pharaoh. And that was fine. Pharaoh then said, well, you guys are here just for a period. Take care of your things and your flocks and so on. Because in Egypt, shepherds were looked at as being a low class, low whatever type of people and so they want they had to show that they were not there to just eat up the good of the land but they were there to look after their flocks to just spend some time until the, the family is over and go back home and so i believe that's what joseph was doing in protecting his family certainly i said there that's what families usually do when especially when you are traveling even for a vacation or you're thinking of migrating they prep you they ensure that you're going to say to the persons the, who interview you, the right things that you're going to say. And I believe you, they, Egypt was not their home, and he didn't want them to find themselves in a position to be too entangled in the political affairs of what's happening there. He didn't want them to get there knowing Ruben and the other guys. They could end up in a situation where they try to feather their own nest, like we see in political circles around here, and lose the whole vision. But Elder Vaughan, as we continue along the vein, read Genesis 47, 3. And my question to you after you would have read it, what was so important about their profession? Why did Pharaoh ask? Okay, so Genesis uh, 47, 3 says, Then Pharaoh said to his brothers, What is your occupation? And they said to Pharaoh, your servants are shepherds, both we and also our fathers. And yeah, I think I might have alluded to that in my previous response, but it was important that they be true about their profession because Pharaoh did not, although Pharaoh trusted and believed in Joseph, these were his brothers, they were not Joseph. And so they had to be truthful about who they were and what they are. And they had to show to Pharaoh that they are not thinking of planting roots there in Egypt. They are just sojourning. They're just passing through. Just, they're just there for a while. And as the uh, commentary says that shepherds in Egypt, it doesn't say why, but they were looked at lowly um, in terms of not very high in, in terms of social status. And so Joseph had to make sure that what the brothers were saying to Pharaoh and what, why Pharaoh asked is that they were not going to be saying that, you know, well, I'm a political statesman, I'm a senator, I'm a whatever, because then Pharaoh would say, uh-huh, I can use these guys and I'm going to put them in, in, in political office. And that is something that, I guess, was not desirable on Joseph's part, on his brother's part. And I'm not too sure what Pharaoh was looking for, but he was just looking for honest men to show that they were not going to be slackening off. They were not going to be just parasites living off of Egypt, but they will be industrious and working, taking care of their flock. And even go further, he said, if they could find someone that could take care of his own flocks. And so that was a plus in their regard. Absolutely. Elder Pascal, the Genesis chapter... 47 verse 7 and my question to you would be how should we relate to our leaders yes yeah, so genesis chapter 47 3 and verse 7 and joseph brought his brought in jacob his father and set him before pharaoh and jacob blessed pharaoh El joseph there is a verse in the bible Mark chapter 12, verse 17, that Jesus cautioned 
his people, he says that render unto Caesar what is Caesar and unto God what is God. And they were amazed with what he said. The thing about it is that Jacob understood that, that he, even though he was head of his family, a great nation that, was, that started to bloom, the nation that God took apart from the other nations, even though Jacob understood that he served the, mo the, 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 the most awesome God, a God that no other God can stand against, the real true living God, he was respectful because here you saw he went before Pharaoh and he was not as if, okay, Pharaoh should submit to me as the oldest, the eldest man in the room or because I serve the living God. But the Bible said that he went in and he blessed Pharaoh. And so when we are in situation and very often in our colloquial term, we say respect is given where respect is due. So if, in fact, Jacob recognized that if, in fact, he was supposed to represent the true God of heaven, he ought to go into Pharaoh in this stance. Not that he was basically bowing down before Pharaoh as a man, but he recognized and appreciated that Pharaoh was the, 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 the king of Egypt, as it were, the ruler. And there is respect that ought to be shown to this king. In addition, he was accepting his family to be a part of his place in order for them to survive. And so that measure of respect was issued out from Jacob. And so we should as well, Elder Joseph, take a fed out of Jacob's hat. It's not because we are really bowing down, being submissive to, to things or practices but in order for us to reach people, Elder Joseph, we have to be able to be strategic. Sometimes we figure that we can turn up our nose or we can believe because I am a Christian, we can, you know, but God wants us to be humble. He wants us to understand that he, we should reckon where we can take hold of it so that our lives can be testimonies and God can work through us so that he can, we can, they can see him in us. And so in a nutshell, that is why I think fear, Jacob wanted to be as humble and as approachable to Pharaoh because he wanted Pharaoh to see God in him as he would have seen in Joseph. Okay. Elder Vaughn, whatever our station in life, what should it mean to us in how we treat others, that we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. And that can be found in 1 Peter 2, 7. When we look at how Jacob approached Pharaoh and Joseph served in his courts, how are we to consider ourselves as I am a public servant, you're a private citizen as well, working there. How should people see us as we carry out our business day to day? An uh, interesting question because, you know, the, the text there in Second Peter verse 9, it is, it says, we're all priests of the holy nation. And he goes on to says that you may proclaim, this is what Peter says, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we've got to proclaim and praise God. Proclaiming means speaking about God, means talking often of him and speaking the truth about him, letting others know about the God that we serve. And so whether you're a public servant or a private citizen or sole proprietor, businessman, whatever walk of life your profession is, or your vocation is, we all have a responsibility as professing Christians to show forth, to proclaim the praises of God. And Elder, we can do that in our simple daily walk, in our simple daily life as we interact with individuals. A sermon is better lived than preach. 
And so we've got to live the sermon. We've got to be individuals who are reflecting the light of Christ wherever we go and all the time. A very simple song that a lot of young people sing, and even us who are little ones, we sing, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine all the time. It sounds simplistic, but it is very filled of theology and truth that we've got to be loving, caring, all the attributes that Christ has demonstrated when he came and he walked upon this earth towards his disciples and to all the people that he engaged with. We've got to demonstrate that. And so Joseph, being a slave, being ill-treated, being thrown into jail, and all those things, being hated by his brother, getting a point to take revenge on his brothers, he never did any such thing. He brought his father to, to bless Pharaoh, brought his, his, his brothers out of poverty and brought them into a place of a land of plenty. And Joseph demonstrated all of that. And so that is where we've got to let our royal priesthood be shining like a, like a light, like a beacon, wherever we go, whomever we come in contact with. Let Christ be the light that we shine to others. Yes, the Elder Master, it's a similar question pertaining to that passage. And it says, what obligation does our faith put on us? Yes, Elder Joseph, because we can determine our lifestyle, the way we approach life. Sometimes we go to church, uh, we claim Christianity, and persons are always, trust me, when we do things, people always have the world to see than an ordinary man out there in the world because they expect better of us. And as much as we go around and they, they may claim, oh, no, they will say that, you know, they will say what they have to say, but within their minds, they are expecting better of us. And this is what really that our faith, we are obligated to do as Christians. We are obligated as Elder Vaughan would have said, to be that light, that light that will say to someone, even though they may not say it to you, there goes a Christian. And, and, and it is so important because can you imagine when Joseph took over governor, even when he took over governor, Elder Joseph, you saw that he was making it uh, his business to show Pharaoh who he was still as a Christian. Because look at the wisdom he demonstrated in chapter 47 whereby he not only increased the, the seven years, but then even during that, those years, he was still bringing funds into the treasury of Pharaoh. And in addition to that, Elder Joseph, the people around him that was coming to him, they respected him. And so they saw Joseph, they didn't go to Pharaoh and they said, look, all the grains we have is finished. What can we do? And he said, bring your cattle. And they brought it. And so you, you, you're seeing that Joseph was this figure in Egypt that introduced the God of heaven and brought that measure of knowledge to the people that there goes Joseph, who's God, the most powerful God ever known in Egypt. And so as we go around our daily business, let our lives so shine before men that they may glorify our father which is in heaven and that is our obligation our daily obligation is to point people to jesus thank you thank you so much elder Maskell. now we have come to the end of our lesson for today and elder vaughn what would be your takeaway from this quarter's lesson you have already shared that with us and how applicable are the principles in the study for us today. Well, thanks, Elder, and great to be at the end of another quarter. The principles are very applicable. The principle of forgiveness, the principle of allowing God to let his spirit work through you, like Joseph would have done, and even for the brothers of Joseph, for them coming to the point of realizing, uh, repenting even of the mistake the misstep that they would have done in selling their brother into slavery. It took some getting there. It took some trying times and Joseph really testing them. But in the end, we can say and give God thanks that these brothers, as vile as they were before and as wicked as they were before, there was some change in them. There was a turnabout in them. And we can see how God relentlessly, as I said at the beginning of this lesson, God has a relentless pursuit of all of us 
it has been a, a let me just say it earlier it has been a chasing game a, a race where mankind run and hid in the garden of eden and from since then god has been running behind mankind trying to tell them to just 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 stop all the while wait up i'm not trying to get you i'm not trying to, to smash you with a sledgehammer i'm trying to save you and god is chasing after us all we need to do is to stand up and let god apprehend us and we see that over and over again this is just genesis but there's a lot in it and as we go through the other 65 books of the, of the word of God, we see God still chasing human beings because they're running from God and we ought to stop running and realize that God is not there to harm us, but he's here to save us. That's my final word for today, Elder. Thank you so much. Elder Pascal? Yes, my takeaway, Elder Joseph, is I, I like to look at the, the lesson captioned for today, Jacob settles in Egypt. And even though we, we, we sometimes find ourselves in Egypt, I like what Joseph did, Elder Joseph. He made sure that even though his family was in Egypt, they were separated from the Egyptians. And he, in his wisdom, he didn't want them to get caught up and all wrapped up in what the Egyptian thing was doing. He figured that, okay, I have been able to test the test of time, stood the test of time in Egypt. But my bro brothers, I don't want them to be exposed. So I am going to say to them, look, tell Pharaoh the truth. You are a herdsman. You are a shepherd. And Egyptians don't like this. It's a curse to them. And so he kept them in Goshen so that they don't get caught up and get high positions. And so I'm saying to us as Christians, even though we're in Egypt and we are called to be um, examples, we are called to be testimonies, let us hold on to what Christ wants us to be. And that is that testimony or that example for him. And so, ironically, the lesson say Jacob settles, but they went, but they knew they weren't there to stay. We're looking for a better place, Elder Joseph, the land that flows with milk and honey. And someday God is going to come to take us home and he is going to reunite just as how he reunited Jacob with Joseph. He is going to reconcile us and reunite us to the place he wants us to be, to a better world. And so let us stay focused and remember the stories in Genesis so that we can become better people as we look to our king in the near future. All the best to everyone this morning. Okay, I want to thank Elder Maskell and Elder Vaughan Joseph for an excellent study this quarter and an excellent study today. We pray that as we go through the upcoming quarter, considering the crucibles, looking at the topic, the crucibles, we pray that you will be even as blessed. I want to say as we close out today, search me, O oh God, and know my heart today. Try me, O oh Savior, and know my thoughts, I pray. See if there be some wicked way in me. Cleanse me from every stain and set me free. God bless you and have a wonderful day. And as you Turn off this morning. We pray that you will remember to like, subscribe, and click that bell. And if you have a comment, be sure to place it in the column below. Thank you very much and have a good day.